I'm very curious what your thoughts are because if if it isn't intrinsic that human beings, particularly Europeans, are genocidal, then what what do you think that fear and that anger that comes up when white people are asked to look at that history? Where do you think that that root really comes from, relating to the culture that the the cultural um, components of this crisis that you've spoken to? I guess that that's a clunky question, but basically, I'm trying to ask like, where do you think the root of this um, fear, resentment, and anger comes from when this genocide, this history, is brought to the forefront of people's minds? It is a clunky question, and it's yes. About- 50 questions in one. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, but those are really important. Those are really, really important questions. So I I don't have a succinct answer mm-hmm. because it wasn't a succinct question. Yeah. I have a tendency not to have succinct answers anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, even just the same questions. So I'm just going to kind of roll around in, in your ideas there for a minute see what comes out okay um the the difficulty of dealing with the genocide is uh the pain that comes from seeing the dehumanization uh it's the guilt that comes up too because regardless of how individualized uh people are in this society there still is a uh, societal identity. There still is a cultural identity. America is a culture. It could even be argued that the Americas are a culture in terms of how the Americas have dealt with indigenous people, uh, which takes it beyond what we generally consider uh, uh, whiteness, okay? Because if you go into Latin America, uh, Central America, South America, you're going to see, uh, you see like a genocide against the Maya in the 1980s that was uh, wrought by a man named Efrain Rios Montt. Uh, and it was supported by the Reagan administration. It was armed by the Reagan administration. And I have argued that that, was allowed to happen against the value systems of most Americans, I believe, because Indians are invisible in the American imagination. You know, it was no secret. It was a fear, it was billed as a fear of socialism or slash communism, uh, but it was the 1980s, right? <laughs> so, what was that about? It was really about protecting U.S. business interests. And there was a lot of collusion involved and such. But without getting into details about that, um, it's the ignorance that allows that to happen, the invisible Indian. Uh, when I lived in Guatemala, you know, and came back up and People say, well, what was it like? I said, man, the Mayans everywhere. They go, no, the Mayan civilization disappeared. Well, the vast majority of people in Guatemala at the time I was there were Mayan people. Not mixed blood people, but Mayans, you know? Uh, and people don't know that, you know? I, I teach some Mayan books in my uh, Native American lit classes because as far as I'm concerned, Every indigenous person in the Americas is a Native American, you know. Uh, so, again, it goes beyond whiteness. It goes into a cultural framework, and that cultural framework is a framework that, al- that allows for exploitation as the base of human as a base of human experience. It's kind of like taking the golden rule of do unto others uh, as they would do unto you and modifying it a little bit, saying do unto others before they do unto you. And that's, it's kind of a, 
the bumper sticker says, nice guys finish last, right? Don't do business with your friends. Uh, don't talk religion with your friends. You know, there's this kind of distancing into the self that's, that's extremely cultural. And historically, I think that comes, that comes from Western civilization, it comes from Europe. Uh, some people argue it came out of Mesopotamia a few thousand years ago and spread across Europe and destroyed the uh, feminine-centered, uh, again, not archies, but feminine-centered uh, societies and earth-based societies in Europe and created the patriarchies and all that came here. And you had the inquisitions there. John Trudell said people here did crazy stuff because they had four or 500 years of crazy stuff being done to them. So it's, it's the abuser, you know, uh, is, is, is formed out of being abused. It's kind of that mentality. So I don't think it has anything to do with, I, th I think it's, I think it has a lot to do with whiteness, but I don't think it's, uh, that whiteness has a franchise on it. Again, I think it's more of a mindset because, uh, you know, over time, uh, a lot of indigenous people have inhabited that mindset as well, you know, and uh, the boarding school system was set out to destroy the native culture in the sense of community. The floor of Congress in 1900, they said, uh, we must destroy so, quote, we must destroy the sense of community, foster a sense of the individual, and create a good Protestant work ethic. And so the boarding school system was uh, practically 100 years long, and it took children out of their homes from the age of five, out of their cultures, stripped them of their language, their values, their sense of community, everything. It was done on purpose because it believed even the... I think even the uh, the people that supposedly loved Indians or cared for or respected Indians felt like their cultural uh, uh, life ways were superior, right? I think that's still what people believe. You know, so I I see people looking back and wanting what they imagine Native people had, but I don't think they really want to do the hard work to look in and, into their own characters, into their own society and say, how do we really inhabit community in the deepest sense? I don't think very many people are willing to give up their individuality. So when you have that kind of cultural uh, meeting point and, and, and genocide comes out of that, and you have to look at the genocide, and you're an individual, and you're still part of a, a, a cultural consciousness that starts to hit you when, um, when that guilt comes up. You know, when you look at the genocide, you look at all that killing, you look at that dehumanization, and you're shocked by it because it's horrific, and it's your ancestors, right? And in a way, when you look at the Washington R word, it's the people right on the uh, right around the corner <laughs> who are still inhabiting that same sense of superiority and dehumanization. The mm -hmm. tomahawk chop and stuff like that is dehumanizing. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not taking an AR-15 shooting a bunch of native people, but it's dehumanizing and it has a, a powerful effect on native children, as I mentioned before. So what happens when people are confronted with the numbers, the data, and especially when they're confronted with Native people telling their story? Because there's still people around, they're older now, but they can tell their experiences of being in the boarding schools or going through the forced sterilizations of the 1970s, right? There was a whole bunch of forced sterilization or sterilization without consent, without people even knowing it in the 1970s. And I've had women in my class testify to that. People who lived on native reservations 
went in to give birth, gave birth, came out, could never have another child again, went and got an examination to find out they, that they'd had their uteruses taken out without their knowledge. Okay. This is the 1970s. Okay. So when people start looking at all that, guilt comes up out of that cultural, collective cult, cultural consciousness. So first of all, if you've been raised to be an individual, you have to admit that you're part of a culture, right? America doesn't like to think of itself, it calls itself multicultural, but it really is a monoculture in a way with a lot of people of a lot of different colors fitting into that monocultural value system, okay? And there are all kinds, not to say that, that, that they're all equal, in their sense of entitlement and all that. There's very, very varied uh, experiences there. Uh, and white supremacy is, is a definite reality, you know, and I don't mean that just in terms of skinheads, but just something that people inhabit and believe because that's what the culture has brought them up to believe. Um, but so part of the American culture is that guilt is, some, is a bad thing to feel, okay? And it's a real position of privilege to say, well, I don't want to deal with that because it makes me feel guilty, okay? And I'm not, I'm an individual, I'm not really part of the culture, but then you start to kind of fall in and you go, wow, you know, this was my great grandfather, right? This was my grandfather who did this, you know? And I've had students that have actually dug up letters. One, her, her grandfather was a doctor uh, residing next to a native community and he wrote very proudly that he, that he never, treated a native person, that he refused to treat Indians, okay, as a doctor. Well, there's the Hippocratic Oath becomes a hypocritic oath, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's endemic. That's part of the culture. So because we don't want to feel bad, you know, we say, well, I don't want to feel guilt. Well, that's a tremendous position of privilege to inhabit to say, well, I don't want to feel bad. Well, what about all these Native people, all right? Well, they've got to work that out or whatever. You know, so there's that separation of us and them that's part of this culture. So you're asking about where does this start? I don't know where it started historically. There are theories about it, like I said, Mesopotamia, like that. My emphasis more is uh, coming from my cultural standpoint that the potential for any kind of behavior is existent in all of us all the time. That doesn't mean that the negative potential is an inevitability. What it means is that the negative potential is something there that we make choices, we make active choices, and whether we're going to inhabit that negative potential or a positive potential, to put it in a kind of a simplistic binary. We make choices about if what we're going to do is going to feed life or if it's going to take advantage of life. All right. Uh, some people would argue that that means that evil is intrinsic in human beings. I don't really subscribe to the notion of evil. It's kind of an import to me. It's a cultural import but I do think of things in terms of right and wrong behavior. And uh, I've made a lot of bad choices in my life and things that I've done that I've felt really, really badly about. And having to look at those things 
is an important part of my process of maturation. And I think that that's the case for everyone, really. You know, we can, we can justify our bad behavior and walk on, but really it goes with us all the time. You know, that's why I, I keep saying to people, a lot of people want to envision a better way to live life. Okay, and I'm all for that, but you can't envision a better way to live life with, without a really close analysis in the deepest sense, which includes an emotional analysis of how we got to where we are right now. You know, you can't fix an engine unless you can take that engine apart and see what's broken. You know, that's a simplistic analogy, but I think that's the hard work that people have to do. And I think that that, uh, Dr. Kyle White is a Potawatomi scholar in Michigan. He talks about, uh, in an essay, he talks about the tipping point that people are concerned about, either the tipping point of two degrees Celsius, right? And how we have to act really fast to, to stop that tipping point. And he says that the, 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 the real tipping point uh, started, uh, we've been long past, long ago. And that was that we lost right relationship. We lost a sense of kinship. Okay. The sense of kinship uh, was the real tipping point. And that's what needs to be brought back. So this is a generational project which is, I think, one of the things that I see now with climate change, people are completely freaking out and acting as though this comes out of nowhere, right? Well, this has been a long time coming in one framework and a very short time coming in another framework, okay? It's a long time coming if, you're, if you identify with America as something that exists, has existed for a long time. So this look, this kind of goes into how you see time and how you see time and space, right? So if you're caught in a certain kind of linear model of time, then 500 years ago, or say here in California, a couple hundred years ago is a long time ago. But for like my friends who are California Indians here, they've been here 20,000 years, according to modern science you know, 18, 20,000 years. For them, they've been here since the dawn of time, okay? So for them, 200 years of colonialism is a very short experience. And one good friend uh, that I have, Greg Castro, uh, it, it says we're still in first contact. 200 years, when you look at 20,000 years of existing in a place, and you look at 200 years of adjusting to this genocide, okay? then there's still an adjustment to the genocide. There's still an adjustment to erasure. They're still struggling with this big time, all right? So all of what's happening now in terms of COVID, in terms of climate change, is a very fast logical progression to them, okay? You can peg it to the Industrial Revolution if you want to, but to many native people, they peg it to that predatory nature. Okay. Does yeah. that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, it did. I think it did. Yeah. And whatever. And I'll go that's on. That's a cultural thing. The predatory nature is a cultural thing. It's mm -hmm. something we pass down. It's passed down to children by people's behavior. 